Join us and see what life looks like from a medium's perspective with Tracy Lockwood, the medium's medium. We'll explore the tools of psychic development, hear stories and experiences from the other side, and learn to listen to our natural intuition. Now, our host, Tracy Lockwood. Hello, beautiful lights, and welcome to another episode of From a Medium's Perspective. For those of you that are watching the video, you're probably wondering, who is that, Tracy? Who is that? But I'm not going to tell you yet because I have to shamelessly self-promote first. So if you are interested in developing your abilities, your psychic mediumship abilities or channeling, I teach private classes. Yes, that means you and me on the video live from wherever you live. And uh, we go through different things. I have a three-tiered private mediumship course, levels uh, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, uh, four weeks, six weeks, and six weeks. And I teach channeling privately. I teach my certification program privately. And if you're interested more in group training, twice a year I offer a 12-week professional psychic mediumship certification program with three levels of certification. You will earn what you earn. And, um, and uh, I also offer a four-week channeling course also twice a year. So if you're interested, hit me up on mediumtracylockwood.com. All right, that part's over. And now we get to the good stuff. <laughs> okay, so... Today's guest, and before I tell you who he is, I must read. Uh, it, first of all, he's extremely well-known. You might even already be going, I know who that is, Tracy, but in case you don't, um, he is really widely recognized in the fields of New Age thought, in shamanic transformation, magic, mysticism, and the occult, aka hidden knowledge. And he is CEO of CSI Media. He is founder and publisher of Magical Blend Magazine. And that is no, like, just some kind of little rag in the corner kind of thing. This has been touted as one of the most open-minded magazines in the world. Okay, so, and he also uh, published Natural Health and Beauty Magazine and uh, Transitions Magazine, too. He is a visionary and an entrepreneur, and he says he's one who befriends shamans, magicians, holy men, and gifted psychics. So, um, he was host of Magical Blend TV. And he and his wife operate, op, operate, oh darn, I'm going to have to give you a clue, Langevin Axelson Marketing Social Media and PR Company, and they publish the Echo World Magazine. And he's also authored three books, and we're going to be focused in on generally one of them, but you know, I'm going to take it all over the place. Um, he's written one called Spiritual Business, and you're like, hmm, what? I'm saying, okay. Secrets of the Ancient Incas, I know you're interested, and Secrets of the Amazon Shamans, which is, yes, we're going to talk about that one today. So his, he has a blog at Michael Peter langevin.com welcome to the show michael peter thank you very much it's nice to be with you tracy absolutely and usually our guests are snooping on the web so i'm going to give that to them spelled out so that they can find that and you can also email him at the same michael peter langevin at gmail.com but here we go so michael peter okay langevin l-a-n-g E-V-I-N, Langevin, 
We actually say Langevin. Langevin. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Oh, no, I know. I've been it spoken <laughs> wrong from uh, Quebec. Langevin. Langevin. Michael yes. Peter Langevin.com. And so I am really tickled. I'm just beyond tickled to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here, Tracy. Oh. So um, I did name the show from a medium's perspective. Um, and I started it because I didn't want to do public readings. I don't do them. I step back from that. And I didn't want it to be sort of a basic, you know, align your chakras and basic, basic show. So I thought our world is really very interesting. And the world of psychic mediums is in all the related fields, you know, going into the esoteric and into paranormal investigation and, you know, spiritual healing and on and on. And so I thought, what would it be like for our listeners if they could kind of catch us at a cafe, we're having tea and we're uh, talking our shop talk at the table and they're like at the next table listening in. So sounds good. That's how it started. So, um, so I guess the first thing I want to ask you is, how has doing what you do, which is a pretty heavy connection to shamanism, plus all these other goodies wrapped up in a bundle, how has that uh, knowledge and experiential base shifted your perspective on life in general? How has it changed? Well, you know, Tracy, I, I think it, it's constantly shifting my perspective on life. I, I think if we choose to accept that magic exists, that shamanism exists, that, that as you said, the world is uh, a pretty interesting place, then we have to realize that it's much more than the material world that most people deal with every day, that it's, it's like an onion with many, many layers. And a lot of those layers we can't see, um, but they have an effect on us. We know that the way we think has an effect on us, uh, our actions, our words, and for me, that's the basic of shamanism and magic is that we, we really can change our lives and, and have an effect on the quality of our lives, not necessarily on a consistent moment-to-moment -moment basis. It'd be nice, but that's more for movies and comic books. But, but for most of us, we can overall have just a blessed life fulfilling our, our dreams if we embrace that and, and bring it into everything we do. I, I use magic in, in uh, both of our businesses. Um, uh, I used magic raising my children. I was a social worker for a while and, and did therapy. I, I use shamanistic techniques in, in healing my clients. Um, I think it affects everything we do. I think we took over the Echo World magazine uh, not quite two years ago and Circulation has grown radically and we get tons of compliments from people on how it's affecting their lives. And I think it's because my wife, Sophia, and I work with magic to try to do the best we can with that and bring out the best. And I, and I, and I think we have that responsibility. We can, you know, we can turn on the TV every night and check out or we can decide to, to, to focus on what's going to improve us and improve our lives. And, and that's for me what shamanism and magic really are. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, and, you know, pulling on those dimensions of ourselves that the average workaday person might not really be thinking about. Yeah. Well, th well, that's it. You as someone who teaches psychic abilities and intuitive abilities, you know that we all have these abilities. It's just that some people are born and they're awake in them already, or they, they trip along the way and something comes in. Uh, where others, they have to sit down and work with them. But if they sit down and work with them, especially under the right teachers, they, they just open up to seeing auras and chakras and feeling subtle energies. And even telepathy becomes something that comes in often as a way of life. Just knowing things by regular standards, we shouldn't yes. know. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I'll sense that client's not going to show up. And I'll already sort of in my mind be planning an alternative thing. And of course, I check on them and they're not coming. Do you right. know? It Time doesn't and again, mean things like that. To, but something might have come up or, you know, whatever. Yep. They chickened out or... Yeah. <laughs> well, so, sometimes I'll, I'll walk down the aisle in a supermarket and I'll say, why is that person having such a bad time? And I'm like, well, wait a second, that's none of my concern. <laughs> but you right, just feel right. the vibes but that it's observing. It's observing. Yeah. It, does, it, does, it does change things. And, 
and maybe make us stiller about other people's situations because we see it at the depth that we do and I think that's a big part of it. I mean, there's, there's a level, there has to be a level of empathy. Uh, I, um, I just, uh, for the magazine, interviewed Daniel Brinkley um, mm -hmm. last week. And I don't know if you know Daniel, but he's, he's had a number of best-selling books oh. and near-death experiences. He's come up uh, recently uh, through another guest. I'm, yeah, go ahead. And, and beautiful. He, he, even though he, he does a lot of public speaking and a lot of, uh, a lot of, um, uh, writing of books and, and self-promotion, he spends 20 hours a week volunteering in hospice. And, mm -hmm. and, and I asked him why, and he set up this whole organization for, for, for veterans and what have you. And he said, when he had his near death experience, he realized that we were all going to have a full life review. And that the main thrust of that review was what did you do for other people? And what did you do to make the world a better place? He said, and I thought I better get on that. You know, and I think that's really true for all of us. It's like if if we want some quality in life, we know the best way to receive is to give. Um, and and if you have a problem, if you help someone else, you generally get over your own problem. And I, and, I, and I think that's really the essence of magic and spirituality. Yeah, and it is. It's you know, instead of asking energy to flow to us to meet all of our mundane needs, which is fine to ask for, we are here. And it's a bountiful, bountiful but universe. Also to expand that energy and let it flow through us to others and see their lights light up and continue, you know, it's really. Well, well that's it. When, when I'll write an editorial or, or work on a book, what I try to bring through is what's really going to benefit the people who are going to read this. I know I have my stories and I want to share those, but how are those going to benefit the readers? You know, mm -hmm. and, and and that just allows me to write on a whole different level than I would if I was just writing, I want to be a great writer. <laughs> oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, you know, um, there's a lot of curiosity about indigenous, the wisdom that indigenous cultures uh, had. And it seems like worldwide to me that different cultures, their adherence within the discipline, because there's always... You know, there are people that are interested and then they're the dedicates, yes. you know, of whatever, you know. And so it feels like those uh, number of dedicates have shrunk or geopolitical changes have happened or something has occurred to where that culture gets fragmented and that wisdom is like held in a tenuous balance. And I'm seeing all over in different traditions, um, uh, not personally, but lived through the, the lives of my guests, uh, these traditions being passed on to people that are outside their culture. This, this, we're, in a time, we're in a time of change in the planet, without a doubt. And, and yes, I think a lot of the indigenous traditions um, that I've been exposed to in Latin America are either almost disappearing or are being handed to, to, to people outside of the traditions. It, it goes all over the map. The great thing is with the internet and technology now, things are being saved and recorded that would have been lost. But uh, I mean, I have a really sad story. One time I was in, um, uh, in Brazil and uh, I had met this shaman who, who said he had a cure for, for brain tumors. Um, and at the time I was passing through and I didn't think much of it till one of my sisters developed a brain tumor. And then I decided to go back and visit him. And, and he said that uh, he had, uh, I, I had to wait two days because he had to climb these trees that were on the south sides of the mountains. And when he climbed the trees, he cut off a piece of bark and he brought them down and there was kind of a fungus growing inside and he scraped out the fungus and boiled it and reduced it down to a brown mush. And, and gave me that in a packet. And he said, bring this back to your sister and have her take it with red wine every night uh, and it'll cure her brain tumor. I brought it back. She took it. Not only did her brain tumor stop growing, the doctors were in awe, but her emphysema went away. So I went back two years later thinking, this man has amazing medical things. His, he had died, his apprentice had taken over, chopped down the trees, cut off all the bark, and going to Rio de Janeiro to sell it and become rich. I, I guess it was lost to us. And yet, I, that's such a, a feeling of almost sacrilege, you know? 
and, um, and yet, and yet I, I've kind of grown to, I mean, there's, there's a few different levels of that. On, on one level, many of the people who have moved into the Amazon to do cattle ranching, ranching uh, after they've chopped down the trees and got cattle, they, a few years later, they realize they're depleting the soil and this isn't going to work. And they return very closely to the ways of the native people that lived there before them. So you have this, like there actually is a reason that people farm the way they do and lo relocate the way they do. And exactly. Do. And, and, and um, I've often gone down to, to Cusco and, and one time I worked with a group called the uh, Cusco Weaving Cooperative. And what they would do is they would go out to the isolated villages high in the Andes and they would pay the grandmothers because each village in the in the Inca Empire used to have its own special, unique weaving techniques. Is that like Bolivia-ish? This is more Peru, but it, yeah, Bolivia, oh, Ecuador, oh, oh. Um, even some Brazil. Uh, mm -hmm. And the isolated villages, they'd pay the grandmothers to teach their grandchildren the old weaving ways so they wouldn't get lost. And then they would buy the best weavings to bring back to Cusco, Peru, to, <laughs> to put in a museum and to sell to tourists and then bring the money back to the villages. So wow. th there's organizations like that that are existing that are keeping the old ways alive. Yes. Uh, so there's a lot, and there, like you say, there's devotees who are extremely interested in the old ways that are, that are seeking it out and finding it and sharing it with others, both in books and, and, and videos and, and what have you. So we're going through a time of radical shift and change, but there's a lot of information that, seems to be going away, but is coming out in other ways. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you, what, like, um, I always thought it would be so cool to train with, like, the real deal. Do so know? did I, and, and <laughs> I, I, I- Tell me your story, tell I, me- I, Oh, I got endless stories, but yeah. when I was, uh, when I first went down to Peru, uh, when I was in, in college, and uh, had just mystical experiences, got to, I had almost no money when I got there. We're talking thirty dollars, and I was determined to make it last as long as I could. And I ended up spending six weeks traveling around um, Peru because the the people were so generous. I got to go into their homes, and you know they'd give me rides in their pickup trucks and what have you. And I I got to see the Nazca lines, and to go to Lake Titicaca, and and go to Cusco, and and um, down to Arequipa and and the volcano. Uh, and, and, and to, to finally to Machu Picchu, where I had visions of the Incan gods and goddesses. And it changed my life. I, I, they told me I, I had been reincarnated, not, not as a chosen person, but as someone who had made a deal with Incan gods and goddesses to bring forth some of their knowledge into the world. And I said, no, you got the wrong boy. I can't even say my eyes right, I'm from Boston. I couldn't possibly be one of your people. And after a few days of them, uh, sort of torturing me in my dreams, I, uh, I agreed. I said, you know, I'll do whatever you want. Let me go back and finish college. I'll do whatever you want. Well, you don't say that to the gods and goddesses. Right. Any gods and goddesses. But uh, I ended up uh, not only starting Magical Blend Magazine and spreading spiritual information all over the world, but writing three books about spirituality, adopting my children in a civil war in Peru, um, and and uh, they're they're in their late twenties and very successful and and they're the best thing that ever happened to me. But it was all part of my fulfilling that statement. I'll do whatever you want to the Incan gods and goddesses. But before I adopted my children, after I finished college, I would save up my money and go back to Latin America every chance I got, searching out um, shamans, uh, mostly in the Amazon jungle, and. Do they call them shamans there? Is that the technical term for them? Or do they have a... They don't call themselves shamans. I know they don't. don't yeah, no, no billboard outside there. If they call themselves shamans, you better be leery. <laughs> the ones that are exactly. near the tourist attraction, I have second thoughts about, usually. Um, but the ones that are... Usually, because I had met some people uh, who gave me introductions to someone, they and that went well, the next time I'd go back, I'd have a lead on another magic worker in another village. And I, and I got to just go to a number of these villages. One of my favorite ones was Eddie. I called him Vanishing Eddie. Uh, Eddie was in uh, Northern Bolivia uh, uh, on the Amazon. And uh, I bothered him and bothered him. And he said, yeah, all right. My apprentice will meet you in town tonight and he'll take you out to my magic hut uh, on the river and, and we'll do some magic. Uh, so. I went out with his apprentice 
And in Peru, they, before the Europeans came, people ate uh, guinea pigs. Yes. And they chickens. So they have high, um, high door sills, and they, they just grow the guinea pigs in the house. They're almost part of the family until it's time to eat them. Uh, so Eddie had a bunch of guinea pigs. And um, we were sitting there, and we drank some tea. It wasn't hallucinogenic tea. He and his apprentice and I. And the guinea pigs just started, like, disappearing and appearing. And I said, Eddie, what's going on? <clears throat> and he said, well, that's my main magic. Is <clears throat> I can make things disappear and appear. And I said, all right, I want to know. I want to know. And he was gone. And then he walked in from outside the hut. I, I mean, he was sitting in front of me, and then it was – and I said, Eddie, how did you do that? How did you do that? And then I was outside the hut. And I said, this is getting weird. And I said, Eddie, I, you gotta, you, is this real? How, how do you do this? And Eddie disappeared. And, and I was living in, in northern uh, California. And <clears throat> where I lived, there was a lot of yellow thistle that doesn't grow too, too many places. It, it was, uh, uh, yeah, pretty common in northern California. That area. Yeah. Eddie came back reappeared and had a handful of that thistle. He said, I, I went to where you live. Everything's fine there. I just thought I'd tell you. I said, Eddie, I, I, need, to, I need to learn this. And, and we drank some more tea and he talked around it. And then he was gone. He just disappeared. And his apprentice and I waited and waited. His apprentice said, yeah, you were pushing him kind of high. He doesn't like to share too much. Let's hike back into town. Maybe he'll be in the bar. And sure enough, Eddie was in the bar drinking. And I, and I, and I, said, I said, Eddie, Eddie, I, I want to be your apprentice. I want to learn this. And he looked at me and he said, Michael, you're supposed to be a writer and a teacher, not a shaman's apprentice. You'd be a terrible student and an apprentice. <laughs> That's an idea right now. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I'm sorry you didn't get to do that. But That's, oh that's okay. But I met, I met a number of shamans, got to experience their magic, got to got to share that some of them shared secrets some of them didn't but but it, it's more that the experiencing of it um the and and what and i always thought eddie it was a precursor to, to a lot of the other ones that my path wasn't really to get the detail of that specific teaching but to more share with people that it is still there in hidden places harry potter and gandalf really are, are Amazon and, and Incan shamans that still live and exist and teach. And, and magic is a way of life. Once you get away from the tourist places and spend some time there, people expect magic to be just to, to be a way of life, which is yeah, so good. Yeah. Best. Wow. Know? Wow. You know, I was just thinking um, how – different that is from people's experience because we get so preoccupied with this world we just get so preoccupied with and we all do i mean I, i've seen these things and 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 been with a lot of spiritual people doing magical blend i i got to having printed my own published my own, having books of mine published i got to sit, to sit on stage with deepak chopra and Miriam williamson and carol mace and 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 uh and and you know and, and hold seminars and, and what have you and they're wonderful people. Yes, yes, real people. I think um, I, that's one of the things I really love about the show here is that um, you do get to see beyond the uh, the claim. The oh acclaim. yeah, once you pull it, and some people are nothing but their claim. Sadly, you you sit down to dinner with them. And they start giving you this spiel about their latest book or, or TV you're show. Like, you're on like autopilot. I had trouble like mm, mm, yep, pulling yep, them yep. off the, the thing, you know. Yep. But, <laughs> but other people, you know, once you, you, you get a chance to get them away from the stage, they're, they're just yeah, really, really, really wonderful. How, what a great experience. Oh, what a wonderful experience. Yeah, yeah. so obviously that probably led to your writing uh, yeah, I, I, it really, it really did. I mean, I always, I always wanted to write. Um, I, I, I worked on a lot of hobby magazines when I lived in Boston, and when I moved to California, I just met all these amazing people. This was in the uh, end of the '70s, um, early '80s. I, I met all these amazing people who were teaching all these classes and getting rejection notice 
for their writing and their art from all these magazines. <laughs> and I said, well, it's not that hard to produce a magazine. Why don't we just get together and do it? So we did the first magical blend in my living room in San Francisco. Wow. And, and after 27 years, we were sold in all the states, all the chain stores, um, 33 other countries. Wow. And yeah, no, it was, it was, uh, it, it was, it was, uh, the budget was humongous. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I still kind of wonder how I signed that many checks and so little money stayed, but <laughs> I guess, I guess that's living a good life. Um, but, it's all good. But, Everything good in the hood. Everything's yeah, fine. That's it. But I, but by the hood pub win. <laughs> yeah. by publishing yeah. magazines, uh, I got to refine my writing, writing an editorial every month, writing articles, and, and then meeting all of these, these great, uh, teachers, both in the Amazon and the Andes and on stage uh, across the U.S. of A., I, I really got to realize, well, yeah, I, I have some special stories to tell, some unique Yeah, and stories. it's yeah. my understanding that that is the second printing, like it was... It's, yes, the was Secrets of the, Secrets of the uh, Amazon Shamans sold out the first time, and, and now we've reissued it. It's available, um, right now it's available as iBook. It's supposed to come out again in print sometime here in the next year or so. Wow, yeah. wow, wow, yeah. that's amazing. That's yeah, it's, cool. it's really quite exciting, yeah. It's, it's nice to, Congratulations to, know, on that. to know you get books. I mean, the, when The Secret of the Ancient Incas came out, which was my first book, uh, I got a lot of compliments. It touched a lot of people, but for me, the favorite one was this. Uh, I got an email from this guy who said he was in a gang in, in L.A. Uh, he said, well, you know, it's a Latino gang, and most of us are from different um, – different Central American countries, he said, mm -hmm. and, and uh, one of one of our relatives gave one of the members your book, and he read it, and he liked it, and he brought it for the rest of us to read, and we realized that there was a rich culture in every country before the Europeans came, and we started doing research, and we feel so much better about ourselves because of that, and for me, it was like, if no one else read that book, that, that, that meant, alone would be an amazing uh, connection for yeah. them. If, I, and if, and if, if what you do, if you if you speak on a, a radio show or, or or on stage or you write a book or you write an article and it touches someone and, and it makes a difference in how they view reality, then, then it's all worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Um, I don't know, like, uh, I guess, tell me, could you share another story? Sure. Uh, you and I talked a little bit before we got started. I'll, I'll share a tools how to. Um, yeah. I was in one of the isolated villages. The villages in the Andes still to this day are quite interesting. Once you get away from Lima uh, on the coast and away from Cusco, mm -hmm. a lot of them are, are just where the, where the Inca villages were high up in the mountains and they have dirt roads that go up there, but the winters are so rainy. <laughs> that the dirt roads turn into just mud, waist high mud. You can't drive a Jeep. You can't ride a mule. It's just, you're, they're in the village for the winter. They're isolated villages. Uh, so there's traffic between them uh, and, and people during the rest of the year. And I, I got to visit a lot of these villages where a lot of the old ways continue. The, the, the Inca lifestyle hasn't changed that much. They, they're, interesting. They're raising corn and and quinoa and and potatoes high high in the mountains. Um, one time I was in one of these villages and there was a group of kids. The Incas didn't have a written language. They they kept records of things by tying knots and what was called uh, capus. And um, and they they many people believe that they not only kept records of how many llamas were in a village or, or how many people lived in an area, but they actually recorded stories by how close and how large the knots were and that storytellers kept the 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 conquistadors thought they were evil devil's tools so they burnt most of them but the ones that have existed that continue like the mayan codexes the ones that continue are in museums and people are still trying to code them i, I have met uh, shamans who believe that the incas used to fill them up with telepathic energy so that another magic worker or, or a psychic sensitive person could pick up the rope as they feel along to the feel knot, the knot and feel the messages image that we're thing oh sort of like a a written history or oral history but kind of psychometrically embedded in yeah it's knot. wonderful to stretch your mind there <coughs> i i was in one of these villages and there was this this group of kids and they were they were tying knots on sticks and laughing and 
and having a great time. And my Spanish is pretty weak. And my mm-hmm. Quechuan, which is the native language of, of that's descended from the Incas, is, is weaker. Um, but but I, 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 I was with um, a translator, and, and basically I said, well, what are they doing? And he asked them, and they said, um, we're changing our lives with these knots and these sticks. And I said, how? And they said, well, you, you tie three strings here on the left, and you tie a knot in each string for what you don't like in your life or you want to get rid of. So I tie a knot here that my father's not going to yell at me anymore. And I tie a knot here that my chores aren't so hard. And I tie a knot here that I'll stop getting in trouble uh, in, in, in the neighborhood. And then you, you keep those knots, you, you either hang them on your wall or you put them under your pillow and you think about them every day. And when, you're, when, you, when you've passed three, four weeks, you t- cut them off and you burn them. And you've gotten rid of what you didn't want in your life. So then on the right side of the stick, you tie three strings and you tie what you want to replace them with. I want my father to think I'm just the best ever. And I want the people in the neighborhood to really like me. And, and I want to have fun when I'm doing my chores. And, and then you do the same thing, but you keep those on your wall because this is your new life and you can add knots to them anytime. And, and I've taught this to people in classes and seminars and, and, and it's in uh, along with another, a lot of other tools in one of my books. And, and uh, people have come back to me and just said, I, I changed everything in my life because of that exercise. Um, oh, yeah, that's really amazing manifesting and releasing attachments and bringing it, it, in good. Real basic magic that these kids yeah. were using has its roots in ancient Inca empire that works still today. Um, wow. Yeah. No, it's, Is that in your Secrets of the Incas? Yes, that was in my Secrets of the Ancient Incas. Yes. Mm-hmm. I, when I, I set that book up, um, there was a civil war in, in, uh, in Peru for a long time. Uh, back in the 70s, and mm-hmm. uh, the shiny path, uh, Sendo- Sendero yeah, Luminoso, path. or something. Yeah, that's it. Very good. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're, we're, uh, had conquered much of the Andes. Uh, Cusco was, was really not safe to go visit. Machu Picchu was not having a lot of tourist trade, and Lima was threatened. Uh, and uh, my then wife and I decided that we were going to uh, adopt two children because there were so many orphan- orphans there. Uh, so we, we went down to Lima. The social worker in Lima had told us that it was going to take just a matter of a week to make the paperwork go right. We'd have a would have a new son. Well, when we got down there, we were in court. They said, uh, "Well, there's this other baby too, and and um, if you took them both, it would probably go really faster." So we signed all the papers. Six months later, we left as a family. We had lived in Lima, Peru. <laughs> Uh, mm. trying to make the family legal in a time of civil war when the electricity was going out, the water was going out. Uh, you'd go out of the Hall of Justice where you were signing papers and they'd say, no, don't go out front, there's a riot, people are being shot. Get, go out the back and take a cab back to your hotel. Um, it, it was the most amazing, wonderful bonding experience. And, and, and to this day, my son and my daughter are my two best friends in the world outside of my wife. And... and um, I wrote the book, The Secrets of the Ancient Inca, using somewhat that as a backdrop. And I had spent so much time in Latin America that I had spent a lot of time in libraries with translators, translating the old Inca knowledge that was first brought first brought through through converts to the to the um, early monks, uh, and in the villages where I talked to a lot of the grandmothers, elders, and 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 uh, <coughs> wise healers. And mm-hmm. I used that information to try to take a lot of the information that was lost from the Incas and make it available for people to use in their day-to-day life um, in the 21st century. Um, it's beautiful. I, I'm going to pick up a copy and I'm going to, I have a friend that I'm, she's from Bolivia and I think that would be very significant. I've had, I've had people from Peru who live in Lima buy the book and then follow where I've gone in the area because they said, well, you know, I just never had a guidebook that felt magical for me to, to travel through through my own country with. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been to Peru once, and you were talking about the clearing that was yes. going on there, and um, I went down to Iquito. I yes. landed in and went to landed in Quito and went to Iquitos. I believe it was down the you know down the Amazon about seven miles. It was a Explorama Lodge, I think. Uh-huh, uh-huh. 
had just a wonderful time there, but we I did run across this tree that was quite sizable and um i didn't have i mean I, I the only reason i went down there is i was studying geography and international development with an emphasis on sustainability and food systems and uh, my master's program and i i just wanted to see a rainforest it was sort of like scientific like i want to see a rainforest before they disappear yeah I mean, I was sad about it, but I didn't really know. But when I got there to that tree and it was, you couldn't put your arms around half of it. It was huge. Like, I don't even know how many people it would have taken to go around four when or you, five, when maybe. When you in the, in the Amazon jungle and you, you can feel the life force. Trees That's like it. That. That's it. And I thought, I now get it why people strap themselves to a tree. I totally no, it's, it's true. Uh, up in the north coast of California, the old growth redwoods have a similar feeling. The ones that haven't been longer. Oh, sure, yes. Because they're, they're ancient, and they and they just have they the, and they hold the memory. They they, you know, they, all life is sentient, so it, they it have is. witnessed all these years of people coming and going on the planet, and fires, and all kinds of things going on, wind, and. I, I've done a lot of. Um, uh, hallucinogenic substances with the shamans because a lot of them that's their path and their teaching i don't think that's for everyone mm -hmm. um but it is yeah. a it is a valid spiritual path and it is one that a lot of the shamans oh, it's for eons i mean i don't because uh i'm allergic to so much i would probably right. die <laughs> right. but and everyone has uh, different and yeah, also that's... also like uh the purpose would be to expand your consciousness exactly. and you've yeah. already got that happening it's right. been natural to me, so I for, don't. For me, it's it's established reference points and allow me to see things from a different perspective. And yeah. one time I was doing ayahuasca in a ceremony there, and I was in the jungle, and I I reached my hand out to the jungle, and and I couldn't tell where I stopped and the jungle began, and, and it wasn't for a week later when all the ayahuasca was completely out of my system that I realized all my life to that point I had been looking at it wrong. When we talk about the weave of life. I don't stop. The jungle doesn't begin. We're really interconnected. And in that moment, I felt it fully. Wow. That, yeah, that we really have. That's an epiphany. That's <clears throat> like a really profound insight. It really is. And, and since then, I mean, I always spoke in that intellectual term of the weave of life and the connectedness yeah. of all things. But all since then, one. Yeah. But <laughs> since, yeah. But since then, there's a level of, I, I agree with what you said, that trees are sentinel, that rocks are sentinel, that they all have a story that if, if you sit with them and just go into a trance state or a meditative state, they want to tell you things and they're willing to. And yeah. You can really get information from so many things. To walk in the Amazon jungle and in the daylight see the blue butterflies in the canopy of the trees and then at night to see the eyes of the of the uh, caiman alligators on, on the river glowing gold. I mean, there's just... It, it's 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 a Disney movie. <laughs> yeah, you, you're, yeah, you're in you're yeah. in this really fantasy existence that that's just beyond human and beyond our New York City uh, or or Tokyo uh, 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 modern structures. I just taught the first of my four week channeling. Well, I finished the class, but I had just I mean the first time I've condensed that type of information in one package. And uh, one of the exercises was to become a rock and to channel the rock. And it was so interesting. Everybody's reaction was so interesting to see. They just didn't imagine that they would connect. Right. And they ended up bringing these incredible messages through that yes. were just the fabric of the matrix and yeah. It's, it's true. Um, my, my wife, Sophia, is, is uh, well, I consider her a Nordic witch. I, I, I think she has other titles too, but, uh, and, and uh, she, she taught me a whole different way of opening myself up to messages. Um, yeah. That, because that, my traditions of, of shamanism and occultism in the States was very different than the Nordic path. And, and it's just amazing to me uh, at this point in my life, after doing so many, so much magic, that I now am open to receive so many different clear messages that are like, 
I couldn't make that up. We're, it must have come from somewhere. Oh, it has to. What would? How would you differentiate the difference? Like, well, it's been fun. The two of us getting to get. We we met uh, on a bus uh, in Cusco, Peru. Uh, she was on was on vacation, and I was. Uh, That's so interesting. Uh, isn't that like a, what an interesting soul connection? You were both there. Uh, yeah, it, I mean, talk own, about things being in your mad. own right and your own passion. Yeah, yeah. and 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 we, it's a five-hour bus ride from Cusco to to uh, to Puno, and by the end of the bus ride, we we're in love. And then we re met in Bolivia, and we weren't letting each other go at that point. So, uh, so so three years later, we got married, and she moved here to Virginia to be with me from Sweden. And uh, one of the things we've worked out over the over the time we've known each other is is our different magical paths because she's written books on Nordic goddesses and I've written books on Inca gods and goddesses. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's sweet. And uh, is it a lad? He's uh, he's uh, eight years old and he's um, a, ch a, a pug and a dachshund. I'm sorry, I'm listening that's to you. I'm just picking them up because he um, they're you know, beautiful. reassurance I'm going to put him down later. So. Uh, and, and, uh, and, she, and she studied nordic magic to the greatest degree and and when we first sat down to do ceremony together it was almost comical because we couldn't we just had such different approaches it was just so different approaches so how different. would you can you quant i'm so curious um, yeah no it is it's yeah. tricky and, and i'm actually working on a new book speaking of living magically and trying to explain some of the differences and things she's taught me and, and i think i've taught her and and uh and i would say mine was much more verbal uh and ceremony doing putting things in places and and not that hers isn't <laughs> right. ceremony, but hers was much more feeling and being with and receiving um for uh in, in a whole different way that that now when we when we do magic together it's extremely powerful because it's a it's a combination amalgamation of these different systems um that that I, I am much more really sensitive. amazing. That's really yeah, no wonderful, rare treat cool. to have us both have dedicated our life to studying magic and shamanism and 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 witchcraft and what have you, and and then to have come from such a different world. I mean, Sweden is such a different world. Than and the join States. those traditions really in a centralized practice. I'll be, please keep me on your list too. Of, oh, I will. Yeah, no, it's coming along. I think yeah. this year I'm going to get it to the publisher. <laughs> I, well, I'm proud of you because I have two books and I have not, I mean, I throw notes in my email in a folder, you know, but, and I, I know. My, my, my role model this year, that's going to let me finish it is, uh, uh, and my wife's better at this than I am, but uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes. Yes. He was, he was a medical doctor uh -huh. and he used to write the books on prescription pads in between his patients. Oh, well, then I feel less bad because I've got you know, I, I stacks figured... of envelopes and folders <laughs> of shredded ideas, like just not shredded, but, but, like, but yeah. it looks like some squirrel is like trying to communicate <laughs> with the other side or something. I think that's with everything. As long as we're making progress, we're moving in the direction to get things, to get things completed. <laughs> yeah, and that'll be the next big push. I have a couple of things to knock out, but yeah. Oh, that's so, so interesting. And I think she's going to be on the, um, I'm gonna record. Yes, her. you gotta bring her on. She's yeah. she's, she's eloquent. I, yeah. I consider myself a very good writer, but I consider herself a, her a great writer. She her two books are only out in Swedish right now, but she's working on an English one. And, oh yay! Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It, it is. Oh good. wow. Yeah. So um, what? Ex you have this like other side. You know, a lot of people think if we're into the woo-woo side of life that we have no mind, you know, brain, you know, we're in our mind, they're in their brain, the two worlds shall never meet, but often there is a balance. And I think there needs to be. Yes, I, I think so too. Talk to us a little bit about, um, for, I was thinking spiritual business. I don't know if that crossed. Yeah, well, that was, that was <laughs> well, I wrote that book about, um, how I ran my publishing businesses in California. Mm -hmm. and, and because I had studied so much with shamans in Latin America and met so many uh, magical people and spiritual people, my, what I really tried to do, and no one's, I, I don't claim to be enlightened, no one, no one gets it right 100% of the time. But what I tried to do is run the business and run the office with the principles that the magazine was putting out to the world. Because I figured if we couldn't, then, then what was the point of it all? 
Right. Uh, so, so I tried to keep the staffs involved, even if they were new people or, or the fellow who, who, you know, came in to wash the floors, keep them yeah. involved in what we were doing. And we tried to keep reinventing it. And we tried to, to, to have meetings together and, and, and offer sessions of ceremony and, and spirituality. So, so I wrote the book. Basically, the truth is I was sitting down with a man who's become a very good friend of mine, Frank Tamako, who's written, I don't know, 13 or 14 wonderful books. Mm. Uh, I was sitting down with him in a bar at, at a convention, and I was telling him stories about how I run my business. And he said to me, you need to write this up. I, and I said, yeah, who's going to, even if I wrote it up, who's going to publish a book about how I run a magazine business? And he said, I'm a publisher. I'll publish it. So, so wow. I got a contract that night, <laughs> and I sat down and I, and I wrote and I wrote up a manuscript of how we had how we had run the business for years, and how for me it was really important to keep mindful of uh, this isn't just about the profit. This is about putting out good information to the world and having as good an experience as I can day to day going to the office with my staff. And, yeah, running a business ethically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Here, when yeah. We got to um, when I came to Virginia, I worked with uh, the Monroe Institute. I don't know if you know them at all, but they. they I'm, I'm wanting to get to know them. Oh, yeah. they're great. They're, they're they're very good. They really they they have a scientific approach to out of body experience or astral travel. They don't call it astral travel. They're very careful about that. Yeah. But, uh, and and they they had just gotten a new director, uh, Nancy. Uh, uh, McMonagle and she wanted to reposition them. So she brought me, I was working in Mexico and she brought me up from Mexico to help reposition them so that they, so that they were aimed at the people they wanted. So we, we agreed on a year contract and I, that's all I was coming to Virginia to work with them for a year. And then I was going on. Uh, and by the end of the year, uh, mm -hmm. while I was working for them, Sophia came over and we got married there at Monroe Institute. And, and, um, mm -hmm. and by the end, of, by the end of the year, I had so many people asking me to help them promote themselves and their business because so many writers and spiritual people and healers, they use their right side of their brain, but it's hard for them to promote themselves. It, or is. Them. it is. Yeah. And, and, and because I did the magazine and, and I, I mean, I remember distinctly, I'm jumping around a little bit, but there was a key point in the magazine where it was going to go under. I had to lay off much of the staff because just all these, we had made these mistakes, made these big mistakes. And I had to become the ad manager and salesman. And I had to face all my fears about sales, business, promoting. But if I didn't do it, the magazine I had worked with for five years would have gone out of business. Mm -hmm. So I overcame so much of that. And that's really served me in promoting my books, being on stage. Yeah. Uh, and, and Sophia is just a natural at it. So as soon as I started the business, I had too many clients to be able to manage and details aren't my best thing. I'm very good with, mm -hmm. and Sophia, and yeah. I said, Sophia we, yeah. forward in the general, like, yes, yes. Said, Sophia, will you help me? And, and now the two of us for, for almost three years, I've run this public relations and social media company where we've, what a great we've collaboration. People, yeah, we've really helped people to learn how to promote themselves, which is yeah. our real goals to keep it a spiritual business. We don't, we won't work with people who we think they're just trying to rip people off. If they don't have a quality book or a quality product or a quality service, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and then if we feel good about them, it's easy for us to get them on radio shows, to get them on TV, to arrange book signings, to, to mm -hmm. get articles printed about them, uh, and to show them how we do that so that they can do it for themselves. When, That's when, really um, good to know. That's yeah. really good to know. Well, it, it, yeah. And it's been fun. And we've worked with some great, great people. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Um, and tell people again the name of the company because it's, it's Langevin Axelson Marketing. Langevin Axelson Marketing. And um, it's L A N G E. It's hard to spell, but it's L A N G E. If they go to Michael Peter Langevin or Sophia yeah. Axelson on yeah. Facebook, you'll find you'll it. get the connection. Um, yeah. and, we have a Facebook page for it. That's really cool. That's yeah. really cool. And the, and the other thing, I, just a little while we're on commercials, the magazine we do is. The Echo World, and if they go to theechoworld.com, oh, right, right. They, can, they can see copies of it online, so they can see that, because what we try to do with that is, I, the, the people doing healing and magic work here in Virginia are different than the ones I worked with in California or Latin America, and we really want to bring that out to the world, along with a lot of my contacts from the Magical Blend years and from Latin America, 
<laughs> and Sophia's from Sweden. So we have a, a real mix. Is it more, uh, I'm in Virginia, so um, is it more Celtic based? There, there's Celtic based. We, we try to be a real potpourri. I mean, we'll oh, have- yeah, no, right clearly, yeah. 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 We, we'll, we'll have right wing Republicans and, and, uh, and, 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 and Christians who, who really feel that they have a message to share with people. And a lot of the stuff, I mean, uh, last issue, we, we had this wonderful witch from Sweden who, who wrote an article for us. And, and like I said, I just interviewed Damien Brinkley. We had uh, Terry Cole Whitaker and, and uh, um, Neil Donald Walsh. Uh, so, so we have a wide range mm -hmm. of people. Uh, and, and we have a lot of alternative healing, uh, working with crystals, uh, working with herbs, working with uh, aromatherapy, that kind of thing. Oh, that's very cool. Very it's cool. It's fun to be in that position. Yeah, work, but no but doubt. That's sort of the other side of things, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, we, we, I mean, I used to tell my staff, uh, and I still write in my journal, that, you know, if magic's real, you can use it in the marketplace. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And, and, and then, then it's enriching the whole world. I mean, so yeah. many so, so many of the people. What? Oh, another story back to the Amazon, just to switch channels. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. So there was this fellow, uh, he was in, uh, I, I guess it was, I think it was, I think it was Venezuela, uh, near the Amazon. And, and, um, and I was begging him because a lot of times they were like, you know, I don't want to be bothered by a gringo. I was begging him to share some of his magic and, and some of his secrets. And I was sitting in, I was sitting in this hut. It was on the river and this really sick fisherman farmer came in and, uh, he looked at the, the guy, he talked to him for a bit and, and uh, some language I didn't know. And then he said to me, so you want to learn my magic? I said, yeah. He said, you willing to lend this guy some of your energy? And I looked at him and I said, yeah. So he had the guy sit down and usually there's tea with the ceremonies and we, we had some tea and he touched both of our foreheads. Now, what happened next is impossible, but I was looking out of his eyes at me and I could see by looking at my eyes that he was looking at my uh, out of my eyes at me, and I had memories and, and feelings about his love of his family and his village and the river and the fishing and the farming and and how it had gone bad for him and how he was having such a hard time, and and I could see through his eyes he was trying to figure out this weird gringo from the United States world <laughs> and what that meant, and 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 we we sat there kind of confused and dazzled for a while. And, and, the, and then the shaman touched both of our foreheads and, and I was back in my body and he was back in his. We stood up crying, we hugged each other. And, and, and uh, the shaman said, okay, now you've seen it, you can go now. <laughs> and the two of us left and he went to the left and I went to the right. But it was just this sense, I mean, what we were talking about earlier, this connectedness. Yeah. Uh, this magic everywhere, this empathy for others, um, that, that that's true magic. And that's what we, we can experience. And yes, yes, yes. Uh, to everything we do uh, to give it more meaning and to, and to I mean, if I, if I died right now, I'd feel like I had a fuller life, a more blessed life than a lot of people than I ever had the right to deserve. But I expect to do another 30 or 40 years of, of even more uh, because it's so fun. To, to just yeah. get up every morning and say, what, what am I going to do? What magic am I going to bring into the world? What, what laughter am I going to share? Yeah, you know, that experience of exchanging consciousnesses reminds me of that Buddhist philosophy that when you can see yourself reflected in the eyes of another person, you have achieved a light enlightenment. Yeah, well, I, I kind of like this saying that, uh, the, the Buddhist saying that before enlightenment, uh, carrying wood and chopping water and after enlightenment, carrying wood and chopping water. Uh, Absolutely. That's people who claim it's sort of like people who claim to be shamans, people who claim to be enlightened. I, I kind of run away from people who have. Oh, the yes. Yeah. No, I didn't mean it in that way. I right. just meant in terms of that incredible perspective. Of oh, it's, it's really I, mean, I think we have to work at that, that yeah. perspective every day that we have to look and say, okay, well, what is it that I have to share? What, what are my, unique experiences and, and what can I bring to this situation? And what is, I mean, a lot of times uh, working, doing public relations or, or, or doing sales, we sell advertising in the magazine, of course. Um, I, I listen to what people aren't saying. And it's usually yes. as much what they aren't saying as what they are saying 
that tells you how to approach them and how to work with them and yeah. how to help them fill in their blanks. Um, yeah. It, well, Michael, Peter, it, Langevin, yes. Um, we have had a great time and I appreciate so much your being on the show. Oh, um, thank you so much, Tracy. What a joy. And I'll put links, uh, of course, on YouTube below. Great. Too, and so that would be wonderful. Thank you again. And for, thank you. And for our listeners, just remember it's never inappropriate to be kind and without integrity. You have nothing. Talk to you next week.